Well, a tap on that gong should bring them from their burrows. Yes, Miss Richard. A tap, Gossage. I said a tap. You're not introducing a film. fun working together side by side like this. Has, hasn't it? Not my idea of fun, Miss Gossage. Call me sausage. Um, <laughs> Hazel, you tell us, what would you like our bunny rabbit to be called? Well, I think Princess Anne is a lovely name. <laughs> Right for a boy bunny rabbit. No, I think we'll call him Bobby Bunny Rabbit. Well, because it's his name. Look, I happen to know we're not discussing it anymore. His name is Bobby Bunny Rabbit. Sue, don't kiss Neville. He doesn't like it. I know you do, but he doesn't. She just sort of imbued herself into me somehow. <laughs> because here was somebody who was famous, who was glamorous but not beautiful who seemed to me to use all her gawkiness and who used humour as a weapon, but not as a malicious weapon, probably from a defensive point of view. Now I think back about it. At the time in the late 50s, the full fact hadn't sunk in about the empire breaking up. It was still united. One of the things that united it was the media, movies in particular. And uh, Joyce seemed the incarnation of the British stiff upper lip middle class virtues that had got Britain through the war and looked like shaping it into the ideal welfare state. And time is, is, meant, is said to have made a mockery of that. And I don't believe it. Uh, I think those virtues were real and uh, in many ways they've survived and make Britain worth living in still. And she incarnated them. Oh, I say, how jolly pulse throbbing. You're in the habit of writing your name all over the place, Gossage? No, Miss Richard. Then kindly stop doing it at once. I don't think I realised even then that, that you could use comedy to act. I, th I believed, like most people still believe, that comedy and acting were two different things. Um, and now I know, of course, that you can't be a comedian unless you can act. When I was little, the only film we ever saw at things like school parties and Sunday school treats was Bloody Genevieve, which I have to say I loathe with a passion, because I saw it so many times when I was a child. We used to go and sit in the cloakroom and they say, oh, it's Genevieve, oh, God, let's go and sit in the cloakroom. But I do remember, I loved the music of Genevieve and I loved her in that, because she's, uh, she's the boarding house lady, and she's saying you can't have a bath only between a quarter to nine and nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, is the bath near our room, please? No, both the bathrooms are on the second floor landing. The second? Yes, you'll see them on your way up. And when you want to take a bath, would you be so kind as to sign the little book you'll find just inside the bathroom door? Sign right now. Oh, I'm so sorry, but hot water is provided only in the afternoons between half past two and six. There's no hot water? Yes, hot water is provided in the afternoons between half past two and six. Darling, I think we'd better go out. But this is preposterous. Do I have to sign the book in order to have a cold bath? Well, the rule simply says that hot water is provided. You mean I can't even have a cold bath? Wendy, please. I'm very sorry, but I did not make the rule. Well, then who did? Oh, never mind. I don't want to know. No one's ever complained before. Are they Americans? She hated New York. And I think a lot of people she said that to thought she hated it because of the noise and the danger and so on. But no, she didn't like the idea of a manufactured tradition. Uh, one thing that really made Joyce's, Joyce wrinkle her nose was... Uh, the idea of something uh, declared to be old, like one of those New York hotels that pretends to be hundreds of years older than it is. She actually liked the, the rubbed and worn quality of, of, uh, of, of British life. How can you humiliate me like this? I'm an Englishwoman with all the feelings of an Englishwoman. Everybody thinks of Joyce as quintessentially English, but of course she was uh, nearly three quarters American. 
Um, and I think this gave her uh, uh, an openness, although she seems very English, and the characters that she chose, uh, most of them, uh, there are a few Americans and one Australian, but mainly she, she impersonated or created rather typical British characters. She had a, an openness to people, a curiosity about people, which is very American. I have an awful lot of advantages, really, in having a mother from Virginia. You know, she made very, very heavy point about the fact that Virginia was settled by the British. And my father was an Englishman with an American mother from New England, and I think she had a, a grandfather from Dundee. I'm everything, really. She was about 13. Her father uh, took her to Hampton Court, and he said, look at the, the colour of those bricks. And she said, it's red. And he said, look again. And she looked again, then began to see mauve, purple, grey, black, green, and she realised there was a variety of colours. And, and so the colours, she said, were wait there, waiting to be discovered. And I think that is typical of her whole life, a sense of discovery. She said at parties, I, I never minded sitting on the sidelines. I always knew who had worn what, who'd been bored, who'd flirted with whom. I never missed a trick. And um, she was rather still and rather reflective. But, my God, it was all going in to the computer and it was all staying there. And when they came home from parties, she would do everybody who'd been there. And, of course, that's, that's how she got on the stage, as you probably know. She was, she was the president of, after she just got married at 19. She was the president of the Women's Institute. One day we had a lecture from a lady, and I, I always feel slightly guilty about this. I've said it in the book that I owe her royalties. <laughs> and I never paid her because I didn't know her name. But um, she gave us a lecture on useful and acceptable gifts, <laughs> or how to make something from nothing. <laughs> and uh, boutonnieres for the lapel to cheer up a tired winter suit. And it, <laughs> it was to be made of beech nut husk clusters. <laughs> and my gifts are not only easy to make, but ever so easy to dispose of. <laughs> there were waste paper basket tins. And to obtain these tins, you must make love to your grocer and wheedle him into giving them to you. <laughs> She was so full of it when she went to a party given by the radio dramatist Stephen Potter that she did some for the other guests. And she did this, this sketch and, uh, of course, uh, as in all good showbiz stories, Herbert Fargin was at the party and he said, would you come into my new review and perform it? And Joyce said, but I, I can't, I'm married. But she did and she said she was glad she did. When I went to BBC Two, uh, one of the things BBC Two tried to do was to do things in television that nobody else was doing at the time. We wanted to be different. And it suddenly dawned on me that there was a whole set of people uh, who had been very popular during the war and had been popular in the West End uh, Review, who television was totally ignored. They had just dropped out of fashion. And head of the list, by far the wittiest as far as I was concerned, because she wrote her own material, was Joyce Grenfell. And you can imagine them all saying, well, I mean, why has he brought her in, darling? I don't understand it, do you? I mean, what's she get? And then she comes on and does a monologue. You know, there's Nellie Wallace who watched her from the wings and said, what does she think she's doing out there, talking to herself? <laughs> are, are you by way of going into the tea? Yes, I am. Oh, well, Pat is going to be there. Let's all four gather. We can have a natter. Yes, it is actually my first old girls' reunion for far too long a time. <laughs> far too many moons. Yes, well, I'll see you in a minute. Yes. <laughs> I say, aren't you Wendy Plackett? Yes, I thought you were. I don't suppose you remember me. Yes, that's right, lumpy Latimer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I had forgotten, isn't it ghastly? Um, well, my name is now Clinch. I married a man called Keith Clinch, and we've been living out in... No, not in the Argentine, actually, in Kenya. And you have to call it Kenya now. And we are more or less settled here. Um, Wendy, wh wh what's your name now? Still Plackett? Still Plackett. Yes, well... <laughs> It's a lovely name. I, I, it's an absolutely lovely name. I suppose the technique of a, of a one-woman show is that you speak to single people in the audience, even though there might be 2,000 of them there. 
Um, and that, of course, is the, is the secret of good television. You uh, don't say there are four million people watching a show. You say there are two or three, perhaps, at the most. Uh, two or three sitting by themselves, I mean, in the living room. And in the end, she talked to one person. And all she had to do was to project just a little less, and the rest was simple. Oh, it comes naturally to me. My mother sang, you know. I suppose it's the artistic temperament. It's quite easy if you happen to have the flower. I think you're just born like that. I just, I just have those, you know, big flappy ears like people in cartoons and they shoot out sideways when I'm sitting near people. And I think that's what she passed on was her enjoyment of things that she'd overheard and people that she'd seen. And that's her, that, I think that's the key to the, her style. She's just saying, oh, look, I've just heard this, girls. Oh, Fred, just a calucule. Because her favourite thing was to go to Lyons to tea shops and observe people around. I mean, and if you were <laughs> engaged in conversation, there's something happened suddenly that no good. Forget the conversation. It was drinking it all, all in. Incredible, you know. She told me once about being sitting on a bus behind two ladies, and she heard one lady say to the other. You know, Miss Johnson, I don't like those chiffon nighties. They show your vest. <laughs> <laughs> in this particular notebook I have, which starts in 1939, uh, there's a delightful um, record of how one day she was sitting on a bus in Regent Street and she says, on my way to lunch with Ginny, Virginia Graham, I made a mental list of things I didn't know how other people could manage without. And this is the list. Christian Science is the head of it. A husband like mine. Virginia's London flat to soar up to for warmth, rest and cuppers, with, of course, Virginia there. A raccoon coat, Rennie, her housekeeper, and music. <laughs> grew up in the war completely. She decided to join ENSA. She wrote to her mother her weekly letter saying, now you're not to worry about us. We are extremely well, busy and happy. If we're blown up, we're blown up. And life being what we know it is, spiritual and therefore eternal, it couldn't matter. And then she says, of course, she says, we won't be. This is a safe area. And she tells her how, you know, um, everyone walks about with gas masks tied over one shoulder. And she says, Virginia has ordered two cases of bromo lavatory paper and is giving packets of the precious stuff to friends for birthdays and Christmas. I learned a lesson in humility because when I'd left uh, England, I was going to be very polished and jolly and all my songs were gay and rhythmic and that sort of thing. But... I just hadn't quite imagined what the situations were. They didn't want to be cheered up exactly. Uh, they liked to laugh, of course. But what really did everybody good was to sing very slow songs loudly together. I'm feeling fine, but I wish you were here. I need you still. I thought I'd like to say it. 
Reggie wrote to her and said, please come home after Italy. And Joyce said, well, I, you know, I, I think he's a bit lonely, but I feel I must do Baghdad. No one will go there. She said that she, I bumped into Hermione badly at the airport and she said, Baghdad is the absolute end. Ruby. Oh, Tiger. Well, my love. Are you in a position to ask me? You mean, have I been married before? Yes. But naturally. Twice, as a matter of fact. Twice? I think personally, she was pulled between putting love and passion in two separate different brackets. And I think that perhaps in her life, if she did come up against um, passion in its rawest forms, it frightened her away. Oh. You see, dear, something has occurred. But you promised to take me out tonight, and I've had a bath, especially. I got some splendid news for you about my wedding leave. Commandant Forthwaite's giving me 28 days. Hmm, 28. 28 days? Oh. Well, she, she, she said you, you only get spliced once and might as well enjoy it. <laughs> huh? Huh? Denny, has spread our wedding after 10 years? Oh, Sammy, we mustn't quarrel now. The news is too wonderful. Look, it's in the stop press. St. Trillian's? Guilty. Isn't it wonderful? It means the end of that terrible school. Mr. Justice Slender will pass sentence tomorrow. Sammy, do you remember what you said to me on the cliffs at Ventnor? You said, when the bell tolls for St. Trinian's, that means a merry peal for us at St. Vidolf's. Well, we don't know what the judge will say yet, do we? I shall see Myrtle tomorrow. Who? You know, Myrtle's West End modes. Over the fish shop in the high street. It's the only place to get a wedding dress. Ruby, dear, do you think we ought to rush at it like this? Rush? After 16 years' engagement? Hello. Oh, it's about the dress in the window. I know it couldn't be more fun, could it? Well, uh, I'd like to try it on, please. Would you? Oh, good. <laughs> Miss Carpenter? Yes, Mrs. Pudgett. Miss Carpenter, this lady wants desire under the elms. Such fun the names, aren't they? Miss Carpenter, will you take Madam into one of the French fitting rooms? They've done it again. They've set the school on fire. Oh, no! I'd better go and see what's happening. My favourite character that I ever wrote was one of the last I ever wrote, and she was the wife of a vice-chancellor of an Oxbridge university. And the sketches were all called Ing Lit, English Lit. Well, I discovered her when I was cleaning my teeth. Only don't let's talk about me. And I suddenly thought, I wonder what sort of voice comes out of a mouth. <laughs> And I went into the living room where my husband was still up reading and I said, I think I've got my new character. She's going to be very intellectual. And um, I, I can't wait to write her. And I started to talk to him about her and I loved her because she, I, 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 she's the kind of person I really admire. She's very well read, she's literate, she's articulate and she assumes you know as much as she does. Are you a member of this university? And uh, do I perhaps know you? What is your name? Mervyn. Uh, Mervyn anything in particular? Mervyn will do. Yes. I was a member of something called the Sydney University Journalist Club. And uh, Joyce had arrived in Sydney with great fanfare from the press. And we daringly asked her to lunch. And, 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 and she confounded us all by actually <laughs> accepting the invitation. I didn't know we had an underground newspaper in this university. <laughs> and it's called Psst. No, oh, isn't that exciting? Has it been going on for long? Two weeks. Oh, triumphant. <laughs> we were very cocky, and uh, Joyce was rather chastening in that regard because she obviously was a person of accomplishment. Uh, she wasn't just soigné, of course, she was, uh, what did she have? Gravitas, which is quite a hard thing to have when you're funny. I suppose you feel
feel that it's very important that your paper should continue. It has a, a, some mission to help us all on our way. How do you, how do you see that happening? Total anarchy. <laughs> oh, you're awfully total, aren't you? <laughs> Mark, you, and I think uh, anarchy in the abstract has a certain drawing power. And uh, then I stop and I think, yes, but who is going to be responsible for the drains? <laughs> well, I think you should think about that, Mervyn. Plumbing is central to the better life. <laughs> people who want to get rid of everything never quite see it through, I don't think. The only time I ever caught her laughing at me directly, although I'm sure she did quite a lot of laughing in private, was when I declared myself to be a, a socialist revolutionary and carefully pointed out to her that gradualism was useless, that what was needed was a short, sharp, violent revolution. I, was eat I, th I think I was eating her sandwiches while I was telling her this. And for once, I was very young, and for once in her life, she, she burst out laughing at me. It took me a, f a few years to figure out why. But, uh, but, you know, other people's bluster aside, uh, Joyce was the, true, was the true radical, actually. She believed in individual responsibility. Uh, we took Joyce Grenfell's request for pleasure on tour, and to my amazement, when I got outside the theatre, there was no sign of anybody at all. It was about quarter past seven then, and I thought the start was half past seven. And then my eye alighted on a big poster which said, Evenings at seven. I rushed like a mad thing to the stage door, past a frenzied stage manager, straight into the pit and heard the rest of the ensemble bravely battling with the overture, sans piano, leapt into the saddle, got a round of applause from the audience, and it didn't complete the overture, just a first possible cadence point, stop, up with the curtain music, and on. I have no wish to hear your excuses now, or at any other time. And, uh, of course, I was f full of contrition. I, all she said to me was, you'll always remember that. She didn't rebuke me or anything, so I rushed out and got flowers and rewrote words so that there is a lady sweet and kind and some more appropriate words to follow. It's marvellous, yeah. Such peaceful thoughts my mind doth fill Serene my heart today And sweet and calm <laughs> And a doubt is fled away Uncloudy is the view I see And undisturbed something absolutely ghastly. I forgot to go into the kitchen before we came to church to turn the gas off underneath the chicken bones I am turning into soup. <laughs> I know exactly what's going to happen. All the water will boil away and the bottom of the saucepan will get red hot and fall on the floor of the kitchen. <laughs> and very slowly the linoleum will burn through and set fire to the house. And my fur coat isn't insured. <laughs> and where are we going to sleep tonight? <laughs> no troubled thoughts are <laughs> is the way. I suppose if I were to make a dash for it, I might be able to rescue the drawing that is supposed to be my Picasso. But I would far rather have my old photograph books and my cosy bedroom slippers. <laughs> Darling, I don't suppose that you went into the kitchen and turned the gas off underneath the soup. No. Get on with it, you know. First time, <laughs> a cruise for two to Madeira. And then she undone the ticket forever undoing it. And she says, first prize, Lady Clutton Taylor. 
Lady Clutton Taylor. <laughs> you would not credit it, would you? Well, I mean, she can afford to go on a cruise any day of the week. Nobody much clapped. <laughs> and I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. You know, I was disappointed and relieved at one and the same time. And I was just bending down to pick myself up to go off home when I heard my name called. Mrs Moss, Two Elmer Cottages, Bull Lane, a lovely rabbit. <laughs> I look over and there's this woman standing on the platform with a rabbit in her hand. Dead. <laughs> but still in its fur. <laughs> so I think to myself, well, I'm not going to be bothered with that. So I'm not going to let on. I'm there, you see. I'll just sit there. None. That Mrs. <coughs> Amber Crombie. Bravo, Mrs. Moss, you've won a lovely rabbit. <laughs> I think she was very true to herself and she just did exactly what she could do and she didn't try to fit herself into anything that didn't suit her. And that just made her, you know, she was very individual. All the, the good people are very, very different from each other. And she just picked on the thing that she could do and, and got better at it. And that, you know, that's all any of us can ever do, really. Remember, although she was an aristo, she was by no means wealthy. Um, she lived, she lived, she lived a comfortable but modest existence. And she got out and about and saw everything. She wasn't separated by her, by her status from everyday life. Uh, not at all. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm on the bus now and I'm worrying. How am I going to get rid of this said rabbit? I couldn't leave it on the bus. Well, you know, some nosy parker would come running after you. Oh, you've left your rabbit on the bus. <laughs> and I, I couldn't just drop it into the gutter. It was raining. <laughs> and I couldn't put it in my dustbin because they cleared it that morning. And you know how they are now, just once a week. I mean, if that, because they please themselves. <laughs> and you cannot put a rabbit in a bin if the bin's near the house and the rabbit is still in its fur and the period is for any length of time and the weather's mild. <laughs> Well, I'm off the bus now, and I'm walking up Queen's Hill, and I pause to get my breath, and I find I am standing alongside a little red car, parked like, you know, and it's got its window open a bit like that. <laughs> and before I knew what I'd done, I posted that rabbit. <laughs> One way in which her distinction of spirit I think there's no other phrase for it, would come through in her work, was in the way that she would, she would get beyond satire into, into near tragedy, actually. There's a wonderful sketch where a woman is talking and she's the wife of a great musician, a great instrumentalist, I think, someone like Rubinstein or Casals, one of those great instrumentalists who are attractive to women simply because of the quality of what they do and the music they play. So, you are going to write a book about my husband, and I would like to help you all I can. Of course, you know of his worldwide fame as a pianist, but perhaps you are not also knowing that he was quite a family man. A book about my husband, you know, I think he would laugh if he could know. He did not take himself so serious. <laughs> no, no. And as he goes on speaking about how much he loves a husband and where he goes in the world, leaving her at home, it becomes clear to the audience, although not to her, or apparently not to her, that he's misbehaving all over the planet. But then, just when you're ready to think this, what, what a laugh or, or what a pity this woman is a sucker, it turns out that she knows. And subtly, subtly the, the, the monologue turns against the audience's assumption. And you realise that she's made a bargain with life America. He loved America. He said, the best audience in the world for music is now in America because that is where all the Europeans are. <laughs> and Hollywood, yes, in the days when Hollywood was a place, you know. Shirley Brewster, the comedian, ah, she is our family favorite. I think she is so funny. I like her so much. I did not know she was a friend for my husband. He had very good taste. Now, um, you are going to write a book about my husband, and I am going to help you all I can. 
There is just one thing I would ask that you should know and perhaps you will remember. My husband always, he always came home to me. She would talk to young people, not only about the, the craft of comedy, but also the craft of life. The two things uh, went hand in hand, the, the creativity of living, how to be an artist in life, and how to be an artist in her particular medium that she had chosen. And there is a, a wonderful passage in one of her books where she says, um, um, the word magic for me does not mean abracadabra and fairy godmothers. It means certain quite small experiences lit by unexplained excitement. And she goes on to say that in her house, which is uh, in a Victorian conversion, they have two large plate glass windows. And Reggie has planted up bamboo sticks two sky blue morning glories. And he's trained them to go up and across and frame the windows. The trumpets face outwards, so the neighbours get a better view of them than I do. But in the morning, with the light coming through them, they are absolutely magical. Now, visualise if you can. Here we have our sky blue morning glories. And in an outside window box, some very white geraniums with a clashing red, a petunia pink and a sort of salmon. Marvellous, and it's not over yet. In an inside window box, we have three African daisies a magenta, a mauve, and a purple. Got it? Marvellous. Being more of a kind of nature girl, I thought of it as a rose, but of course it was a, a silver rose, was it? Yes. In, in Rosen Cavalier? Yes. Yes. That's right. By Strauss. You know, um, um, Oscar Strauss called his cat Paus. Claude Debussy called his cat Pussy. <laughs> um, Joyce uh, not only kept the rules on the parlour game, um, but she, I think, in, invented a lot of them. One of the things was that you had to um, confess if you didn't know uh, what the answers were. So that um, if you were faced by a piece of music that was totally baffling, some clever person that was sitting next to it would say uh, Shostakovich or something. And then you would say, well, I suspect, a little voice on my right, you were very arch about it, or you were just part of the absurdness of the game. And one sort of, the, I think about the second time I appeared, Ariana Stasinopoulos was on the programme. Now, Ariana was a very big name in, in the gossip columns uh, of, of London at that, that time, and she was a brilliant lady. And Joyce said, we don't tell Ariana what the answer is because she pretends that she knew the answer. How awful. She was keen on tunes, and she would know tunes, and if she didn't know the name, she had this lovely sort of silvery soprano. And she would say, yes, oh, well, we know how that goes on. La, 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 la. And I can't remember the call and, and the name of it. And you would know that only a, the, the most base pedant would require you to know the name. The fact was that Joyce knew the tune. She knew what it was. She couldn't recall at the moment what the name of it was. But nonetheless, she ought to have the point. And I must say, Joe Cooper, who was, <laughs> who was the chairman, said yes. yes Jane gave the points to, uh, to Joyce every time. My neighbour, Mrs. Fanshawe, is poorly plump and gay. She must be over 67 if she is a day. You might have thought her life was dull. It's one long while instead. I asked her all about it, and this is what she said. I've joined an old-time dance club. The trouble is that there are too many ladies over and no gentlemen to spare. It seems a shame, it's not the same, but still it has to be. Some ladies have to dance together, one of them is me. So, stately as a galleon, I sail across the floor, doing the military tour. Yes. 
sit bust to bust. <laughs> You've got to have a quality of selflessness. And if your, your ego gets in the road, you have to overcome it. But you really start scoring as an observational comedian when you forget yourself and start seeing what other people are doing. And she was an example in that. Here is a people who have influenced you, probably for good in some way. People you admire for what they have said or for the way they've lived their lives. For, to repeat myself, people who are what they appear to be, people who disregard themselves very largely. These are my heroes. The power of good was what fueled her life. Good being close to God and she it was, it was, you know, th <laughs> there's a, a wonderful bit in a, in, a, in a sketch called First Flight, which I think is her best piece of writing. And I do it at the beginning of Act Two and she's talking to a man on an aeroplane. It's her first trip to uh, first flight, where she says, it's not exactly my first flight because I flew to the Channel Islands once, but I didn't like it. I came back by boat. But this is my first proper flight with food. Do you know, I haven't seen my grandchildren yet. Well, I haven't seen my son for five years. He went out to America on a contract and he wasn't sure, you know, whether he'd settle or that, but he has, and, and he, he likes it very well. He's done well. He's had several promotions. And, uh, oh, he's in the electronics. And when the last one came, he wrote back and he said, come on over, Mum, I'll give you the trip. Yeah, it is nice. He is, he's very bright, but he's not spoilt with it. Well, they live at a place called, um, uh, I think it's called Stamford, Connecticut. <laughs> oh, is that how you pronounce it? Well, I shan't have to mention it when I'm there. <laughs> they're, go they're going to meet me in New York, yes. Yes, he has, he has married an American girl. She's an Afro-American girl, a black girl. I do hope I'm going to do it all right. You know, I'd like to be absolutely natural, you know, to make it easy for him that. When the, the letter first came, I did have a... Well, you know, I didn't quite know what I... <laughs> but I've brought up my son, Kev, and his sister. I've brought them up that it, it isn't who you are, it's what you are that matters. And, you know, honestly, I do believe that. And... At one point, she, she says to the, um, to the man sitting next to her, um, there's this woman in our church, and she says to me, I don't know why you go on about us all being the same. I look in my mirror, and I'm pink. They look in their mirror, and they're brown. We are different. We're meant to be different. So I said to her, people will always look different to people, but in the sight of God, we are all absolutely the same. I'm sure of that. And then she looks at the man and she says, oh, I hope he didn't mind my saying that. Well, because people don't like you to talk about God. They get all embarrassed and start counting the buttons, but um, I'm used to it. Well, America, here I come. <laughs> Two grandchildren, too, a boy and a girl. Yes, I've got lovely snaps of them. One's very, very dark, and the other, honestly, you'd hardly notice. And his wife is lovely looking. And I know he'd never marry somebody who wasn't nice. She writes me such nice letters, too. She calls me Mother Comstock. My name is Mrs Comstock. And she says, Dear Mother Comstock. I like that. I think, you know, it's kind of lively. When I think of my mother-in-law, I never called her anything for 25 years. <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes dear in a time of crisis, but I think that's nice, you know. Mother Comstock. Oh, they, they met at a concert. He's very musical, is Kev, yes. I wonder, do you think there's perhaps a place where they could be watching the aeroplane come in? Don't they have a kind of, I don't know, observation terraces or that? Well, the plane is turning. There's a building coming in now. I think there are some people up there on a... A kind of terrace place. Yes, there, there are. They're there. They're all there. Oh, I do hope I do it all right. I just want to do it all right. I think she was just a very, very good person, and it's not usual to find people in comedy who have that sort of warmth and generosity. Because none of her characters, she's not critical of any of her characters. And, that, I mean, I like that. I do like that. I get, I get fed up of very cynical acts, and she was very uncynical. Something as very nice has developed 
in, in my life. I think when I began in the theatre, people used to come backstage and say, oh, you are funny, oh, you are this, that and the other. And lately, well, I've retired from performing, but it ended up by them saying, oh, we had such a good time. Now, that to me is the tribute because it means that something was happening. We completed a circle, the artist and the audience, and that is the biggest tribute I think you can make, certainly to an entertainer. There's a very moving comment made by uh, an elderly man uh, at the, her memorial service in Westminster Abbey. People came from all over the country to Westminster Abbey. Uh, it was packed with 2,000 people. And this man said, I never knew Joyce Grenfell, but whenever I heard her on the radio uh, or saw her on television, I felt that she knew me and that she loved me. <laughs> She was, above all else, a communicator. And I think for a woman in that day and age, that was almost unique. And I think, you know, she may not be here, but she'll always be with us. This is a beautiful 